I guarantee you no one in this room is 200 years old, but the county we're in is 200 years old, and it's celebrating its 200th anniversary. It's Essex County, <clears throat> and we're recording this on, what, the 17th day of December 1999. Pretty soon we're going to be shooting for 201 years, <laughs> and we've been trying to get together with our friend and historian here, Reed Larson, for a long time, and w one of us gets sick and the other one does something else, and we <laughs> we've postponed this meeting for about the last two months, but we finally got it together. Reed, how are you today? I'm good today, between calls. Yeah, between calls with Calvin and I. I said, it's your turn to cough. I'll cough as soon as you're finished. <laughs> but we are going to survive, and we're delighted to be here in the old schoolhouse in Essex County. That's right. This schoolhouse was built in 1915. It's been a museum since 1955. And uh, today I'll try out a few things that we have, talk about Essex County history, even talk about one of the skeletons in our closet. I love it. We've all got a few of those. I came in and I saw the old recitation desk on which the old 1858 map of Essex County is resting. And of course, the first thing I go do is look on it and see what kids have written on it, you know? And I, the first thing I saw was diet of worms. If that doesn't bring childhood memories of fourth and fifth grade world history, <laughs> I don't know when somebody wrote it on there, but a long time ago. And underneath was carrots and cucumbers and coffee. I have no idea whether that would have been the diet at Worms. <laughs> but anyway, this is a great building and a wonderful place. And our little corner of viewers might remember the last time Reed and I got together to talk about celebrating the 200th anniversary of Elizabethtown. That's right. It? Elizabethtown preceded Essex County in being formed. Isn't that amazing? And here we are celebrating how many towns and villages and counties in northern New York 200th anniversary. The 1998-1999 were big years for celebrating 200th anniversary. Indeed, very big years. Isn't that amazing? So here we are in Essex County celebrating the 200th anniversary and um, this all began way back toward the beginning, about the third month of uh, the year. Actually, people talked about the celebration long before that. Yes. But Calvin was here recording a very special event in March, which our viewers will see at the end of this program. What was that all about? Well, Essex County was actually formed in March of 1799. And Talking about it being 200 years is a bit of a misnomer. People were here long before that. It, it would be like not naming your child for 20 years <laughs> and saying on his 20th birthday that he was one year old because he got a name. Uh, but we were celebrating the official formation of Essex County at that time. It had been separated off from Clinton County um, and uh, formed a new county. Before that, it had been part of Washington County and before that, Albany County. Um, and that was joining Clinton County at that time as, as part of a chunk. And so we were celebrating the official birthday uh, way back 200 years ago. And as you will see, there was a special board meeting and music and speeches. Everything that you would think would go with a, a celebration like this. Right, but was there a, was there a secret cornerstone or box that was buried? Did anybody have any, we, some really neat old stuff? We did not dig anything up. Uh, uh, one thing that was done, and, and people will see, is that a time capsule uh, was made for people um, to recover things that we put in now. Um, that's great. Years later. Um, but I don't know of any time capsule that had ever been um, buried before. Uh, so there wasn't anything to dig up. But uh, I hope in 100 years that people find some things we left for them uh, well, back in March. That's really neat. This county has an interesting history. Where are we going to begin to talk about it? Well, I'm going to gloss over 200 years of history <laughs> before we that. get to the beginning. Yeah. Uh, so way back in 1609, Samuel D. Champlain came up uh, the lake that would bear his name later. Um, keep in mind, this is before the pilgrims oh, yeah. have, have come over and landed. Uh, he had an encounter with, uh, with the Indians um, and uh, went back up in Canada. No settlement took place here by the French, 
until they began building forts uh, in the 1630s. Uh, the fort at Crown Point um, was built then, Fort St. Frederick. Um, a number of decades later, uh, Fort at Ticonderoga, Fort Carillon at that point, uh, was formed. You can see in history that the, the winners get to rename things. Uh, it's Crown Point and Ticonderoga now as the British named them. Uh, but they actually did have a settlement um, around the fort at Crown Point, and, and that could be considered the earliest European settlement here. Um, this was an area that Indians did come to in terms of hunting parties and things, but we haven't had a chance to dig up a lot of things um, in terms of an archaeological record. Um, one of the things that's happened in Vermont with a lot of bridge projects, hydroelectric projects, they've learned an awful lot about the Native Americans who were in the area um, because that's when uh, things are disturbed uh, and they take up some history. That hasn't happened here as much. So a lot of the Native American history, uh, prehistory really, we just don't know about. Um, but bringing us up closer to date, 1760s, uh, um, William Gilliland came up here, tried to set up a settlement in Willsboro. Um, in this area here, he settled the Willsboro and Essex area, 1765. And uh, at that time, <clears throat> he was able to set, set some things up, but as you know, the Revolutionary War came along. Uh, there were worries that there were British sympathizers uh, up in this area, and the settlement was, was burned. Um, so most of the settlement that took place up here happened after the Revolutionary War. And by 1799, when Essex County was formed from Clinton County, uh, there were really two towns. The town of Willsboro took up the big part on top. The town of Crown Point was everything on the bottom. Um, a couple of years before the county was formed, the town of Elizabethtown and the town of Jay were formed. So at the time that Essex County was formed, we had four towns. Um, and it wasn't actually until close to 1850 that the last town um, was formed in Essex County. And into the 20th century, uh, it took until then, until we had the actual borders of Essex County formed. If, if we look at our map here, we've got a straight line down. Stand over here next to you, Reed. Okay. We've got a straight line down where Minerva is. And one of the problems was the Hudson River goes right along there. Uh, Essex County wasn't necessarily taking care of roads on the other side of the river that were only needed for people in Hamilton County to get from here to there. So there was a land swap, I believe, in uh, 1912, uh, but, but sometime around that period. And that, I believe, was when the actual boundaries of Essex County were settled for the last time. The map we're looking at here is actually from 1858. Uh, it's one of the older county maps that we have. And one of the interesting things about it is it has the names of uh, the people who were living here. Uh, it's the, the oldest map we have that places names with houses. Uh, and it's wonderful for that reason. Has that always been here? Was this here when you got it, or is, or is that a recent acquisition? Uh, we've had different copies of it. This one actually uh, was given to us perhaps about two, three years ago. Uh -huh. Um, we have a copy up in our library that's been restored. Uh, this one's, this one's yellowing. It's uh, still neat, isn't it? It's, it's wonderful, yeah. I'd so. always like to see as close to the original as possible because mm -hmm. you'll see what's happened to it over the years. It's wonderful. With the hooks on the top to hang it somewhere and it's reminiscent of a lot of the old maps that we had in schools in the old days. They'd have stationary maps and they'd have all the maps that pulled down, yes. I can remember, yes. in the front of the classroom. Mm -hmm. All right, where do we go next? Well, I, I think we could talk a little bit about the county seat. Okay. Now that we have a county, yes. uh, the county seat now is in Elizabethtown. But of course, that wasn't 
always so. There really wasn't much in Elizabethtown when the county was formed. So the first county seat was over in this area um, near the Essex, current Essex Willsboro town border. There was a blockhouse that had been built for the protection of the settlers. And that was designated as the first county seat. We aren't sure exactly where the blockhouse was. Uh, we can go to the area and, and be a short distance from it, but the exact location uh, we just aren't sure of at this point. Uh, I have a, a board member and a, a wonderful local historian, Morris Glenn, who's been doing some work down in Albany recently and actually came up with the specifications for the blockhouse, which is the first time that we oh, had a sense amazing. of what that was. Oh. And he stumbled upon this. Uh, it, it was a, a miscellaneous record. Uh, a lot of the records had been burned. And this happened to be in a different place uh, when those records had been burned. So it had been saved, but it hadn't been cataloged in a way that anyone normally would have found it. And he ran across that uh, just a couple months ago. Those are great discoveries, and, uh, aren't they? Yeah, he's working on some drawings uh, so we can take a look at what the first uh, courthouse would have would have looked like. But wouldn't it be nice if you could if you could actually build a blockhouse to those specifications somewhere? Yeah, I think it would be possible. Uh, but it, yeah, it would be nice. Uh, oh, it'd be very sure. interesting. Yeah, so many areas celebrating 200th anniversaries. We've been up in Quebec. Looking, at, we looked at a blockhouse there that was involved in the War of 1812 and the Battle of Plattsburgh from the mm -hmm. Canadian and English perspective, and they've rebuilt the blockhouse there. So, and, and yeah, the, lots of areas have done that. The blockhouse here probably would have been very similar uh, yeah. to that one. Oh, so, that's neat. All right. So, that was the uh, the first county seat. Uh, it's likely uh, that a lot of the business, the courts, and things were probably done at Wright's Tavern uh, in the town of Essex, which w would have been typical. Most taverns well, at that time would have been uh, um, meeting places for, for uh, all ages. And Wright's Tavern is still there today. Uh, it's actually the town hall in Essex at this point. Isn't that neat? Uh, but uh, by um, the early 1800s, I'd have to look, but I believe it's about 1807, uh, a committee was put together, three people, to determine where, um, where a courthouse should be in the county seat in Essex County. And it was determined because of the location that Elizabethtown, with a more central location, would be a good place for the courthouse. Um, at that time, Elizabethtown was on what would become Route 9. That was surveyed in the 1790s. Um, oh, Platt Rogers came through. No kidding. Uh, he was paid for the survey in large part by uh, land grants along the route oh. that he surveyed. And he sold off many of the land grants um, to help pay for the survey. But uh, the, the survey he did in the early 1790s went from Warren County up, uh, up into Plattsburgh. And so present day Route 9, the route has changed at various times, of course was going through Elizabethtown at that time. And uh, so that was where they decided to put the, the county seat. And uh, it's been there ever since. I have a few stories to tell related to the county seat that I, I think Ooh, your viewers will be We want to hear them. Let's go. But uh, one of the things, the, the earliest picture we have of the county buildings is actually right down here. Courthouse uh, and Clerk's Office of Essex County. The Courthouse and Clerk's Office. Uh, the program that, that you'll see at the end of this, uh, where the Board of Supervisors chambers were, occurred in this building right there. Um, the building's been changed since then. Originally it had two floors. Uh, it, uh, the second floor was opened up so it's a single floor now. But uh, that's still there. Uh, it's a building where, um, prior to the Civil War, John Brown's body laid in state. Uh, 
as it made its journey from uh, Westport did not to know North that. Ella. That's wow, right. That's a delicious he, tidbit of history. He's, he stayed there overnight. Uh, so people can imagine that as they watch the later program that, yes. that you see. The courthouse has changed on the outside some since then, but, uh, or on, excuse me, on the inside since then, but the outside's very similar. Uh, speaking of the Civil War, another momentous occasion that occurred um, on the lawn of the courthouse happened in 1861. And that was the sending off of some of the first troops from Essex County to the Civil War. It occurred appropriately enough on a, a date that sometimes we celebrate depending on when Monday falls as Memorial Day. Of course, Memorial Day didn't exist as a holiday then. It, it came after the Civil War. Uh, but a group of soldiers from Company K under the command of Samuel C. Dwyer gathered at the courthouse. Uh, much as we had speeches and things like that in March, there were speeches uh, to send the troops off. And one of the things we have here Oh, we got some, oh my, we got some neat stuff. Take a look at this. This is something Ooh, that we need to boy. work on restoring. But the ladies of Elizabethtown made this flag for the company and presented it to Captain Dwyer um, on that day in May. Uh, he said he would honor the flag uh, with his life. Uh, the troops went to Westport, more speeches, uh, ultimately down to New York City. They were in the first battle of Bull Run, which uh, some of your viewers may, sure may remember in, in reading about oh, that yeah. people weren't prepared for how bloody the Civil War was going to be. There were picnickers uh, out on the outskirts of Washington that day to watch the battle. And the Union troops were, were routed. Um, and. Uh, retreated really in disarray. Uh, fortunately for the Union troops, the Confederate troops weren't really prepared for that either, and they didn't follow them in their retreat. Uh, so it was really disastrous, um, especially from the Union side. Captain Dwyer was sick that day. He didn't participate in the battle. Uh, two of the officers from the company were, were so disgusted at what they saw, that they resigned their commissions and returned. Uh, according to the newspapers, I haven't been able to read anything derogatory about Captain Dwyer, but reading between the lines, it seems that there, he felt there was a stain on his, his honor not being there. A year later in Williamsburg, uh, he had another chance to, to redeem himself, so to speak, uh, and he was shot. He laid on the field of battle for over a day uh, before he could be picked up, sent to a Philadelphia hospital, and died there shortly after. When he came back up north, along with him in his knapsack, was this flag. Wow. And so the flag that uh, Captain Dwyer had been entrusted to protect with his life is now entrusted to us, and I'm, I'm hoping that in the near future uh, we'll be able to do some restoration work on this flag here. It's deteriorating, but it has a great memory, and that's what right. a story, and part of it is outlined, and something that yes. somebody wrote many decades ago yes. down in the corner, Yeah. and that came back with Captain Dwyer's lifeless body. Indeed. Isn't that great? What a story. So, mm, little slices of history. When he did come back, uh, uh, another thing which did happen in front of the county buildings, of course, uh, was the funeral orations happened there. Uh, there was a long procession here, procession out to the cemetery, bands, things like that. So the, the county seat, the courthouse, was the center of uh, really a, a number of significant occasions um, similar to what was witnessed in March. In March of 1999. That's great. 
in so many things, in so many ways, the area surrounding Elizabethtown and Essex County have remained essentially unchanged because it's a, it's a large rural area. When you say there hasn't been much archaeology, it's because there, you know, there's only been a limited number of things that have been constructed out in the rural area. So you can drive around and walk around in these wooded areas and, and be assured that in many ways this area looked the same there for the last 200 years, mm -hmm. and that's kind of neat. Well, some of it looks the same to us now because the forests have grown back. Uh, but a lot of Essex County was deforested. That's a good point. Um, as part of, really, it was iron mining that, that first started that. Uh, How could you mention the history of Essex <laughs> County without talking about it? Yes. Uh, I do have in another room. I'll pull that out in a minute for us. But uh, iron mining was, was really the engine that drove the economy in Essex County for about 100 years. Um, the first reported mining that went on in Essex County was probably um, by some slaves, interestingly enough. Um, mm. Philip Skeen, uh, who had an estate in present-day Whitehall, uh, sent his um, slaves up to the Mariah area um, to dig some surface ore. And some of the ore um, was, was used for iron in Benedict Arnold's ships. Uh, but the ore has traveled all over uh, the world. Iron ore from Essex County has found its way into uh, the uh, Civil War ship Monitor, uh, famous as one of the two ironclads in the first battle, but uh, iron ore for that ship came from Crown Point. Uh, the strands of the Brooklyn Bridge the, are from Essex County as well. As are, interestingly enough, the uh, stones that support the bridge itself. They came out of a Willsboro quarry. Can you see people watching this now? Hey, Ma, did you know? Did yeah. you know? That's a great pieces of history. Yeah, and, and even today it continues. Uh, Nyko Minerals um, mines things in the town of Willsboro and the town of Lewis. And that's added into everything from cue balls, uh, pool table balls to body parts for cars. And so Essex County Minerals still find their way all over the world. Uh, that's something that hasn't changed. Um, we talked about some of the deforestation. What happened with um, iron mining was wood was needed, obviously, to make charcoal. Uh, the recipe for making iron is charcoal, limestone, and uh, iron ore. Put it all together, heat it up, uh, the iron ore separates out. Um, and in addition to clearing forests for that, something we don't think about, but if you have people working in the iron industry, you have to feed the draft horses, all the animals that are doing the work. You end up having to feed the miners and their family. Uh, so as mining grew in Essex County, agriculture grew as well. And a number of places that probably weren't that suited for agriculture were cleared and farmed at the time. And when the bottom dropped out of the iron industry, which would have been really in the 1870s, we started reclaiming our forests again. And a lot of the cleared land started looking like it does today, as a matter of fact. Gee, that's a great, great story and one that you wouldn't think about just driving by now, but we have done some episodes mm -hmm. for our little corner on the history of mining in this area down at Port Henry and Mineville. Yes. And uh, as I said before, you couldn't possibly talk about the history of Essex County without including that because it was a, a massive part of it all. Oh, it was a very big part. And it continued up through uh, the mines closed in 1970. Uh, but there was mining in the town of Mariah area and mining in Clinton County too uh, for a long time into this century. And there, there's still ore in the ground today. Oh, of course there is. And fortunately, some of the old timers are still alive. We've interviewed many, and we hope to interview more before they leave us, because those pieces of history have to be preserved in our memories one way or the other, yeah. right? They do indeed. And, and one of the things people forget and don't expect when they come to Essex County uh, is that this was an industrial area in pockets. I have a picture here. Oh, beautiful. 
All right. Mm-hmm. It seems to me that I might have seen have a copy seen of this. that. Yes, this is from the 1920s, uh, the town of Witherby. And one can get a sense, looking at this, of the industry that really we don't see. We see telltale signs now. Uh, there, there are still some piles Boy, are there that piles. you can see <laughs> there. Um, but uh, the buildings that went with a lot of this are gone now. Um, Look at the names of the shafts. Don't you love it? Yes. Bonanza, Don B, Joker, Harmony. Um, just wonderful. 21 Mine, you know? You wonder where that, where does that come from? Was it mm -hmm. the 21st Mine? I don't know where that name comes Wait. from. I think people are going to have to wait for a later show. You'll have to go down and talk to Joan Davey again. It's great. It's wonderful to look at some of the old photographs from the 30s and 40s and talk to these guys who are in their 70s and 80s and 90s mm -hmm. and refresh their memories just as if it were yesterday because fortunately a lot of photographs were taken during that era. Yeah, yeah. And the mines were really rolling good. So. That's great. What a great photograph that is. Well, we took a little break, a breather, and told a few war stories and things that aren't on camera, but now we're rolling again. Reed, what's next on the, the saga of Essex County over the last 200 years? Well, we've tried to talk a little bit about things about Essex County that tourists certainly don't think of when they come up into this area. And I'd like to go a little further along that. I have a map here from 1839 that has some census information. Oh, great. I love it. Let's do it. Speaking of tourism, boy, that's another big part of what Essex County's been about for the last 200 years. So, what do we have here? Well, it, it gives us some totals for what was happening in the county in 1838. Western shore of Lake Champlain, 43 degrees, 30, 43 degrees, 39 minutes, 44 degrees, 26 minutes north latitude. I love it. That's right. Yeah. But the population at the time, was? Uh, if we look here, it looks like a total population of 20,699 people. We can contrast that with the fact that there were 60,744 sheep in the county. <laughs> I at knew that you'd time. get to the livestock before we were finished. So, here. Sheep raising was a big industry here as it was over in Vermont um, early on uh, in this county's history. Um, and another interesting thing about the population being 20,000, Essex County hit a population of over 30,000 by 1855. Mm. And uh, those of you who look at maps now would realize that we haven't broken 40,000 yet. Uh, so well over 100 years ago, we had been coming pretty close to the population we have today in Essex County. Um, That's interesting. And I look here and I see in the northern part of the country there are the Sable River. Yes. It's wonderful looking at some of these old maps, uh, seeing how some of the names have changed or been misrepresented yeah. at the time. Uh, we have a, a hill really here. It's called Cobble Hill in town. Uh, but on some of the early maps, uh, I believe even on the 1858 map, it's called Giant of the Valley. Is it really? It is. Oh, God. Uh, Giant Mountain, as pretty much everyone knows, is a little bigger than uh, yeah. our, our thousand plus foot hill. Uh, but you see a lot of things like that on, on the old maps that's, that's wonderful. I love it. Capital, $100,000. $100,000. Other things in here, uh, worth noting, grist mills in the county, 21, 205 sawmills. Sure. Uh, paper mills, um, uh, none of course, fulling mills, 20, uh, carding machines, 25. Those would have been both related to the, the sheep industry. Sheep industry. Um, but uh, it's interesting just to go back and, and look at some of the statistics uh, here well, long ago. Yeah, that's great. That's a neat map made in Ithaca, 1839. This is 1839. 
the earliest county map that we have is, is by the same um, maker, and it's 1829. And you notice the colors are mm -hmm. essentially the same? It's... It, some of them are. Now, no, Westport is Yeah. But it, it, it's interesting with the tradition of map making. If we all had to think of the maps we had in school as kids, the same types of colors of course. Are, are still used. That's why I say this, uh, this brings back yeah. childhood memories. Yeah. Not that I go back to 1858, but I do go back quite a ways. All right, what's next? Well, another thing we had, had talked about was the county seat itself. And I did tell you... Um, a story which, while tragic, was noble. Uh, not every story connected with the county seat and the jail buildings is quite as, as noble. And uh, the one I'll bring up now is about a man named Henry de Bosnies. Uh, he came up here from Philadelphia in the early 1870s. He married a widow from Essex, uh, Betsy Wells, who happened to have land. Uh, Less than a year after they were married, uh, she was found dead on the road between, um, on the Lakeshore Road um, in the Essex area. And uh, he was found with a gun and found with uh, a knife. The interesting that, thing... That's the smoking <laughs> gun, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> but what, what seems to make this story interesting, he, was, he ultimately was, was hung. He was the last man hung in Essex County. Uh, this was... Uh, I think I said 1870 something before, but it's 1883, and I have. Oh, do a complete. Pirouette. Okay, that's all right. Your your pirouette is much better than mine. I can promise you that. That's interesting. Oh my goodness. We, oh my goodness. We did have uh, the news that reportedly hung the man. Isn't. Uh, that amazing. In fact, I had mentioned skeletons in our closet. We do have Henry de Bosney's skull here. Oh, come on. At the museum. We do oh, indeed. Oh, my goodness. He, uh, <laughs> the report from the newspapers of the time was that he sold his body to a Westport physician so he could buy a new suit for the hanging. And <laughs> the Westport doctor used the skeleton for educational purposes. They didn't have plastic models back back then. I don't know what's become of the rest of the skeleton, but uh, the skull has ended up here, along with a few other things related uh, to the trial. Uh, right here is a pass to the execution. Isn't that amazing? A pass to the execution? Mm -hmm. We have an autograph book here of, of a boy who was a, a turnkey at the jail. And while Debosnes was in jail, he did a number of drawings. Uh, that's a self-portrait right there. Wow, what amazing writing, huh? But the book is full of, of amazing penmanship, really. That's uh, neat. But he also did a whole series of letters and, and poems uh, to his dead wife. Some are in French. He could speak fluent French. He could speak fluent Portuguese. Uh, and he left behind a whole series to my poor, of letters. My poor wife. Did he acknowledge that he killed her? Do you remember? No. His story was that there was, I believe, a Norwegian who was staying in their barn. And they met on the road, got drunk, and when he awoke, his wife was dead. Uh, but no, he, he, never, he, he never, never acknowledged it. Uh, Look at this. But, uh, Biography, verse? Yeah. What the heck is that? So I, I think it's his own code. Wow. So that is amazing. The, the things he, he left behind her would, would take this story to a, a kind of a different level. Look at this. He was quite an artist, wasn't mm -hmm. he? Mm -hmm. And a very, and a beautiful writer. So, 
So this oh, is one of the nice. events. Those are nice things to have, aren't the they? The courthouse and with, well, with what counties do. Well, they got my uh, attention, I'll tell you. That's a box of goodies for sure. That has some interest. Now, Elizabethtown uh, hasn't always been undisputed in being the county seat either. Um, sometime in the latter part of the 1900s, there was a move afoot to move the county seat to a more central location, by which they meant uh, along the rail line, which hugs Lake Champlain. And so the Board of Supervisors actually did vote in the early 1900s uh, to move the county seat to Port Henry. Uh, I've got a newspaper here. Oh my, that's a little fragile by now, isn't it, huh? So this is from June 4th, 1909. And this actually has drawings for the proposed new courthouse buildings to be built in the town of Port Henry. They never got there, did they? Well, the long and the short of it was, there was a public referendum on the issue. Um, and I, I think the cost may have scared them off a bit. Uh, but the public referendum came in favor of Elizabethtown, and the county seat wasn't moved. Uh, and I don't believe it's been an issue since that time. Among the things that, that came out of this, uh, although it was denied in the press at the time, and the press is very interesting at the time. The Essex County Republican was printed in Keysville and also at various times had offices in Port Henry. Uh, we also have the Elizabethtown Post in our records here. And both sides were very, both papers were very clear about which sides Where's they were taking. I love it. Uh, there was a lot of editorial license taken in the average yeah. news story back in those days and even before that in the 1800s. The writing in newspapers was so different than it is now. Uh, it was very different, but, but at the same time, uh, you knew what angle the newspaper was coming to you from. We also so. know the subscription price was a dollar fifty right. a year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a nice piece. You've got some really great memories for us here. A little sidebar on, on the issue to try to keep the courthouse in Elizabethtown. Uh, a company was formed called the Elizabethtown Terminal Railroad, uh, set up to bring a spur line from Westport into Elizabethtown. If you drive on 9N to Westport now, and you're driving towards Westport. If you look on the left side of the road, you can see where the road was graded. It was graded the entire distance between here and Westport. Uh, but uh, no train ever ran on the line. There, there are stories that someone absconded with funds, but to date in the newspapers, we have found Nothing. no reason why uh, the railroad wasn't completed. Um, there were a number of very influential citizens in Elizabethtown, as you can imagine, who had stock in the company. I'm sure everyone at the time knew what had happened, uh, but it didn't filter down into our newspapers. It's, it's one of the gaps we find in looking at history. Uh, oftentimes I read stories in the newspaper and I say, you know, there's a lot more going on, and I bet everyone knows what it is. Uh, but 70, 100 years later, uh, we don't know. As we just said a few minutes ago, um, the way news stories are covered today is far different than, than it was many years mm -hmm. ago, 100 years ago or 90 years ago. And there were some things that weren't published in newspapers that would be on the front page. Yes. If not the New York Times, at least the National Enquirer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interestingly, there are some things that weren't published. Other things, curiously enough, were. A, a lot of things on suicides uh, were covered with sometimes graphic descriptions. Uh, That's an excellent point, because no, most media don't cover suicides at all now 
for the, what would be obvious sure. reasons to us, unless it's a public figure. Sure, uh, but if you go back in the newspapers uh, well, 100 years ago, uh, it's well covered. That's amazing. So. Oh, I love your stuff, Reed. What else have you got for us well, today? We talk a little bit about transportation here, and we talked about the iron industry being important, but one of the things we don't think of quite as much now because it's so close to us is how important something like the North Way oh boy. going through here is. Because many uh, people are here have never taken the full ride down Route mm -hmm. 9 as we did so many times before the North Way opened. Yeah. And as we do every now and again just because we like it. Yeah. Well, this right here, Parade Magazine used to have a contest on the most scenic highways opened in the United States at a certain time. And this book right here is from 1967. It was the application to Parade Magazine to be designated the most scenic highway, and it, it contains... Whoops. And as many of our viewers know, we were, as they see the signs on a regular basis, don't mm -hmm. they, on the North Way. And every time we drive up the North Way, we look and say, what a beautiful place. Look at this. It contains, this contains photographs of the North Way the year that, that it opened. The truck here actually looks like a toy. This, this looks like a model at this point uh, with some of the photographs of the North Way. It is a spectacular piece of roadway, I'll tell you that. Look at that. Well, that's nice just to have that collection of photographs. It is, isn't it? yes. It, it, it also gives us some idea here of how events um, that really we're outside of the control of people in this county have affected our lives. The North Way has certainly affected our lives in a couple of ways. Uh, it's faster for people to come up here for vacations, but if, if you go down Route 9 and see where all the guest houses and roadside places are, those all shut down uh, at the time. Uh, things like the iron industry. Uh, it was very important to Essex County economically. Um, it closed because of national and international issues. So a lot of things in the history of our county um, are things that people here have, have had to react to but had little control over the, the final uh, event here. Uh, and that plays itself out over and over again. The Civil War, we can talk about all the people who went down from Essex County uh, and never came back. Uh, so it, it's a piece of our history that we sometimes don't, don't talk about. We talk about iron mining, um, but we don't talk about why we don't mine anymore. And, uh, we're somewhat isolated up here, it seems, but uh, we're very closely connected to other areas. Um, as well, and it has a profound impact on what our county looks like. Yeah. Tourism has always been a major factor. Things have changed a great deal in the recent 10 or 15 years with mm -hmm. Canadian tourism, but people still come here from all over the world because of that, the beauty that we've seen and uh, the winters, winter and summer sports mm -hmm. activity and hiking and so on. These mountains are still as beautiful today as they were 200 years ago. Sure. Uh, oh, look at this. You know, by the late 1890s, people would have been coming up here uh, to enjoy the mountain scenery. People still do. Uh, the photo right here, uh, the view today is the golf course at the Osable Club. Uh, that's <laughs> Giant Mountain sure. in the background. Uh, this one right here is, is entitled Colonel Loring's Kitchen. Uh, these are from the 1870s. Um, and actually these are photographs that are made from lantern slides, a uh, precursor of uh, your 35 millimeter slides. Uh, by the night. That's a beautiful photograph. Yes. You, can see the, you can see the smoke rising. Yeah. Isn't that great? Now, interestingly, in this century, by the 1950s, some people who came up to the Adirondacks had a completely different sense of what the Adirondacks meant. Santa's workshop opened 50 years ago. 
Uh, this is actually a photograph from Ardo Monaco's Land of Make Believe in Upper J. We were just talking on a recent program about all of his bad luck with the floods. Yes. Yeah. And so this is this fairy tale castle there. And it, it gives you a sense of the Adirondacks having different meanings for different people. You can imagine a, a family coming up in their car in the 1950s and not taking a single hike in the mountains, uh, but going uh, to the different theme parks. As they did, and it doesn't seem like, uh, wow, 1950 is already 50 years ago. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I wasn't around to see it here the first time, so uh, it's still history to me. That's great. We've covered a lot of the history. What have we, what have we failed to talk about? Well, I'm not sure. Well, why don't we walk over here and cover this uh, okay. display that you have over? As you step over the cord, we this is uh, this is kind of neat. Where did this come from? Well, this is in our visitor information room, and this is a contour map of Essex County. It was actually made by a Philadelphia firm. Um, shortly after the museum opened in the 1950s. And the company that made it used to make um, models for the Air Force during World War II. Ah. Uh, so this is kind of a natural, a natural spin-off. But for those viewers who don't visit Essex County often or certainly don't have this kind of perspective, it goes to show you that uh, we have a few hills and valleys and s small and fairly large bodies of yes. water around yeah. this county. Yeah. Um, one of the things it, it also helps to appreciate is uh, how far one has to go to some other towns in this county. Uh, as the crow flies, a drive from the southern part of Essex County over there in Newcomb up to Lake Placid is fairly short. As the roads go, <laughs> there's no straight road no. going up. Uh, it's, uh, you can walk the lake you can walk the, uh, the trails if you really want to. But most people need to drive uh, to get where they're going. And it's a long way around the mountains. Uh, and the lights still work. Somebody's kept this thing functioning for the last 50 years. As a matter of fact, we refurbished this map just last year. Oh, did you really? We did. And uh, we talked about the north way. And there uh, it is. The lights there show where the exits are. Uh, and where people pile off to go to different destinations in Essex County. Uh, we talked about railroads. A number of railroads have gone through Essex County. Tremendous big part of history of That's the entire right. North Country, especially Essex County. So straight up Lake Champlain, a number of spur lines. There was a spur line here in Ticonderoga. A spur line here, the Crown Point Iron Company Railroad was one of the earliest narrow gauge railroads uh, in the state, and that was designed to bring iron ore from the interior to the lake where it went south, either by uh, train or barge. Um, another spur was up in the Keysville area. Uh, a spur in the northern part of the map is one that they're talking about opening up now, going uh, between Saranac Lake and Lake Placid. And the southern part of the county. That was the latest, last rail line built. Uh, that went up to the mines into Howis and was opened uh, during World War II. Will there be Mineville? Will there be Mineville? I did miss that one. Uh, the, the rail stretches from up here and winds down here, much as the uh, Crown Point Iron Company Railroad connected the interior. This did as well. It lasted far longer than the Crown Point Iron Company Railroad. Uh, one of the first public improvements on a national scale that was done in Essex County were lighthouses. And uh, the original lighthouse at Crown Point uh, and up at Split Rock, uh, those were some of the first national public improvements that were done in this area. The Jay Covered Bridge, you want to talk about a controversial bridge? Well, <laughs> fortunately, with the Jay Covered Bridge, I have a light in the general area, 
whether it's beside the stream or in the middle at this time. Uh, I put it on in the middle of the controversy, a leap of faith that it would go back across the river. Uh, we can only hope so. so I, I do hope we so. We happen to be there through mm -hmm. that whole process. And because we don't have too many covered bridges no, left. In no, no, we don't. You know, another thing that's disappearing that we have on this map here are fire towers. Oh, good point. So between 1910 and 1920, fire towers were erected across the Adirondacks. And uh, a forest ranger during the summer months would spend his day up there looking for smoke. If he found anything, he'd radio down to a headquarters station and uh, they would send someone out to fight the fire. And all of these fire towers were, were built kind of like the old Tinker Toy or Erector sets. Uh, small pieces because they had to be carried up the mountain many times by hand uh, and erected on the top. A number of the lights I have on here, um, the fire towers aren't up there anymore. We actually have a fire tower here at the museum uh, that came from elsewhere that, that we put up. Some fire towers are being preserved though. Uh, the top light there is Poca Moonshine and there's a group uh, that's worked together to save the tower at Poca Moonshine and, and take care of it. So it's, it's part of our history that, that starts to disappear here uh, and comes to museums, some of it actually. It's our largest artifact is our fire tower here and the one most enjoyed by all the school kids who come here. I hope that this day has been and will be an education for people who live in Essex County and those who don't visit nearly often enough because it's got a lot going for it. It's done a lot of things in the last 200 years. It has natural beauty. It has amazing resources of many kinds. And one of its greatest resources is its people. You've only touched on the lives of a few of the interesting people who've lived in, in Essex County, but there are so many famous and infamous people who've lived here over the years. Yeah, and, and there are also so many stories as, as I look through photograph collections we see here, people looking out at us uh, from the past. We don't really know their story. Uh, we can try to imagine it. And it, it has a mind much like mine, because you look at those people and try to get in, try to imagine their thoughts yeah. at that moment, don't you? And you can imagine, even people you know now, you can't really get into their thoughts easily sometimes. And so some of the distance uh, with the past we may not get into that particular person's head, but some of the things we learn from diaries, letters, things like that, I think we can get a sense of what life was like for, for many of the people. Some things were very different, uh, but some of the same feelings and emotions uh, were there then, and it's a way for us to connect to the past and, and try to understand it, and also to step away from the present uh, and get perspective on what we're going through. Sometimes we think it's novel. Uh, I can tell you reading through newspapers and diaries and things, a lot of things aren't as novel as we think they are. No, they've been having, because people have been people for a long, yes. long time. What we'd like to point out in our series of programs and others like it is that it's important to understand the history of the place mm -hmm. in which you live, because you said that magic word, perspective. Without knowing the history, it's hard to know where you are and where you're going. And so I know this is true for you. It's like mm -hmm. preaching to the choir. <laughs> you love the history. And it's fun to learn new things every time you get in another, another cubby hole, as my mother used to say, and find another box of pictures and mm -hmm. goodies. It's, it's fun, isn't it? Yes. Oh. Uh, it's, it's just wonderful. And, and I, I find that most people... Uh, even people who don't seem interested in history, at some point they seem to be going through an old box or something, and something from the past will grab them uh, and, and really mean something and, and change them in some way sometimes. Well, let's hope that little box we got into today with that noose and those pictures and those diaries titillate somebody enough to go to a library and talk to your great-grandmother and mm -hmm. read some books and old newspapers and get involved in the history of your area and perpetuate that to your 
your children and your grandchildren. That would be wonderful. Reed Larson, thanks so much for inviting us here again today. We finally got here. We want to wish you the best of holiday seasons, although many of our viewers will see this after the holiday has long passed. But I'm sure we'll get to see you again in the new millennium. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome anytime. I love it. And stay tuned because you're going to see what happened back on, what was that, March 8th? I believe so, yes. March 8th, Calvin's nodding his head, and hopefully the camera did not at the same time. March 8th of 1999. It's been a pleasure, folks. I hope you enjoy what we do for you, and who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner.